Hello and welcome to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I'm Jim Galante along with Thomas Frank Carr. T. Frank, as always during this offseason, busy week. We get done with the combine, then it's pro <laughs> day, it's the start yeah. of practice, it's Jay Nicklin press conference. Keeping you busy, I bet, my friend. Yeah, we have one week in the spring where it's full on football season again with two. Like, I don't think people realize how long pro day is. And it's not even, uh, we're not even there to see all of the things because they do a lot of stuff in the weight room where the media, there's just limited space. So we're not invited into the media room or into the, into the weight room to, to see that part of it. But it is from eight, eight forty five, eight fifty until about one o'clock. And it just, it goes nonstop the whole day from field tests, uh, you know, the actual measurements and things like that. And then, um, you know, interviews afterwards. So pro day is a really long day. And of course we had Jim, like you said, James Franklin, so much stuff, a, a nutrient saturated week last week. Um, so it's good. It, like we said before, feels good to have things to talk about again. It does lots of stuff. I'll tell you what, what I want to talk about. And we often do this T Frank, you write an article and as usual, I read it, I learn from it, but it even, it increases my number of questions also. So yeah. you, you wrote an article uh, last week uh, talking about the defense during the third and long, just those special uh, down and distance type issues. And mm -hmm. it always leads back to, I circle back to something you've talked about, and I never thought of it this way. You always talk about that 11th man, you know, that one guy who's kind of the variable. Now, you got in depth. And by the way, real quick, tell folks where they could get to these articles. I know there's some folks who listen on our show who may not know, but it's so worthwhile. Please tell folks where they could get all of your stuff, T. Frank. Yeah, bluewhiteillustrated.com. That is the mothership for the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel, which you may be watching here on YouTube. Um, if you're listening on the on the uh, radio shows across Pennsylvania or on the podcast, uh, we have a special offer for you as well. Because you support Blue White Illustrated or because you're here and you're hearing about it, you get two months for $1 with code PSU1. It's a special offer just for our podcast and radio and YouTube listeners because you – are interested in what we're doing already. We want to give you an extra month to try it out. So two months for a dollar. Normally it's just a month for a dollar, but if you use code PSU one, when you sign up, you get that extra time and get you all the way through spring football into the summer recruiting period, which is another big time for Penn State football. So yeah, you want to go read it. Blue white illustrated.com. An absolutely fantastic investment. All right, T Frank, before we start getting into the actual personnel that you talked about, the names yeah. and positions, Let's talk about the basics without, without any names. We mm -hmm. typically, I typically think defense, we think 4-3-4. Four, four. four defensive linemen, three linebackers, four defensive backs, correct? That is a standard base defense that I think historically is the most popular. The 3-4 in the early 2000s was probably in vogue kind of the way offensively. The outside zone West Coast offenses right now, that Shanahan system. Uh, but generally, yeah, the four down front is the the staple of defensive football with three linebackers. To review once again, the Will linebacker is on the weak side of the field, middle linebacker, everyone knows who that is, and then the Sam linebacker, which is really extinct. That's the that's the one that doesn't really exist in a whole lot of defenses anymore. Uh, is to the long side of the field called the field position. Uh, as you might as you might uh, know about football is all the names are typically pretty basic. There, there's not a whole lot of intricacy to them. So those are the three linebacker positions that uh, exist in the four three. Uh, and, and that's where the evolution in the defense happens. OK, now let's do a little bit of history. The last couple of years, it's been pretty straightforward what Penn State has done when they uh, go into, say, a passing situation, third and long, we just saw Daquan Hardy came in as that extra defensive back slot cornerback, correct? So I, I do want to put a little historical context if we're doing that to this, where Penn State is, to, to kind of talk about it in broad terms, Penn State is considering and will likely go to more 
of that as a base defense, which is the second time they've tried to do this. When Manny Diaz first got to Penn State, um, Daquan Hardy is the slot corner. That's absolutely correct. Third down, third and long, those situations when it's an obvious passing down, the slot corner comes on the field. But Dom DeLuca is a linebacker now because Manny Diaz wanted an athlete at that position. Jonathan Sutherland made the transition from safety to linebacker in this conversation. And um, that is the con- that, that is kind of the, the broad picture of the historical side of these things. Slot corner is a big part of what Penn State has done over the years, but there's some, I think, some interesting context to this back and forth between the 4-3 and sub packages for Penn State. But to answer your question, yes, uh, a nickel corner comes on the field to cover receivers when the offense takes off a blocking and or running option off the field, usually tight end, for a third receiver. And even if a team is based in a three-receiver set, Teams will likely go, um, you know, if they have the personnel to play three linebackers on early downs where passing is not as obvious of an option as it is when, you know, you have to do it to get the number of yards to get a first down. Okay. Now, there's the obvious passing downs, but there's also just a standard formation now where I think what we're talking about is depending on the opponent. We might see, say, a 4-2-5 as the standard base package where you might replace a linebacker with a safety. Something we're now going to call the Lion, correct? So this is the part about Penn State that has been unique, and this is going to be the conversation that I started in the last question. Um, Penn State was going to this particular package with Manny Diaz until they weren't. <laughs> and this is the this is the part about Penn State that is unique where they have so many good linebackers that the best linebackers were better than uh those players they moved from safety in 2022. So Abdul Carter has to be on the football field. He was a guy that became so good halfway through the 2022 season that Manny Diaz changed his defensive scheme to get him, Curtis Jacobs, and a middle linebacker on the field at the same time. So that's where we saw Penn State transition back to a base defense from what we're used to. But really, this is a transition that most four down fronts have been doing for years and years and years because the reality is the spread offense has proliferated through the NFL and through college, specifically in college a lot where you are running three receivers the majority of the time. Um, The Big Ten has the unique advantage, I think, of having multiplicity in their offenses. So you will see teams like Michigan that can run two and three tight ends. Penn State that can run two and three tight ends. Even Ohio State tried to do more of that multiplicity last year of running two tight end systems and trying to be more of a power team. But the, the most effective unit and the most effective package in, in in the majority of college football is three receivers. So you have a slot receiver, usually to the long side, the field side uh, in most offenses. So how do you cover that while still being strong against the run? There have been a bunch of different ways to slice this pie. Um, but the last two defense coordinators that Penn State has hired, Manny Diaz used a safety in that particular position. Tom Allen has used predominantly a safety in that position, but has also dabbled in some hybrid players, edge rusher linebacker for those teams he saw that I just mentioned in the Big Ten, but primarily either a slot corner full-time or a slot safety full-time. And Penn State is most likely going back to that this year, but they still want to have the versatility to play either package depending on uh the team they're playing their that team's personality and then uh situational football you know the goal line red zone short yardage they still need to have all of these elements of their defense that they had previously in this new defense under tom allen so that they are prepared for any situation and they have the personnel to do that you know uh t frank sometimes we get bogged down on the oh We run a 4-3, we run a 4-2-5, we run a 3-4 or so. And we forget that there are players and coaches who are part of this equation. I would think that the first couple variables before making the other decisions are are that we've got a new defensive coordinator in Thailand, and perhaps even more specifically, 
We have Abdul Carter moving from linebacker to defensive end. Could you that move of Abdul Carter? It's that creates kind of the domino effect on down the line, how that affects how they set up with the linebackers and safeties. Yeah. So this actually started halfway through last year where Penn State had the versatility with Abdul to uh, start out in a four down front and then shift or stem to a five down front. So they would have their standard four defensive linemen and they would have uh, two defensive ends, two defensive tackles. And really the difference between the two is the spacing on the line that you line up in. So Kobe King in certain situations, certain packages would uh, call a defensive shift. Like he would just bark it out. The defensive line would shift one way and the will linebacker would walk down and suddenly he's an edge rusher. So they were experimenting with this under Manny Diaz last year, not just to get him there as an edge rusher, but also to have five men on the line of scrimmage against Rutgers who wanted to run the ball on first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh <laughs> down. Like they did not want to do anything but run the quarterback. So hence they put the numbers advantage in that situation, but it was obvious that Abdul has the ability to play on the line of scrimmage. So now it's just full time. Now he's doing that particular job full time where he's a pass rusher off the edge and he is a run defender um off the edge as opposed to uh from depth and what that does with curtis jacobs graduating is it opened up two linebacker positions for the team so how do you fill those well you have tony rojas we all know tony rojas we have kobe king we know kobe king those are two guys that are going to be heavily involved kobe king is going to start like he's going to be a guy that is the uh what the whole defense spins around but what do you do with that third linebacker spot they've got some young talented players Kobe King, Keon Wiley, or excuse me, uh, Keon Wiley and KV on keys. Um, and then uh, they have Dom DeLuca, who we've mentioned a couple of times as that leftover carryover Sam linebacker from what they were doing previously. But what if you just didn't play as many linebackers and you condensed your depth into really two positions, then you have the ability to move Abdul Carter, keep your depth, keep your talent and kind of like, you know, the condensed frozen orange juice you get in the frozen section. Like they just did that with their, uh, with their linebackers, instead of selling you the water, it's like, well, you can put the water in yourself. Here's the condensed version. And that's part of the idea behind this. I think, you know, T Frank, this may be the first time I've heard that analogy talking about football, the frozen <laughs> juice. <laughs> analogy. I haven't had that stuff in years. By the way, <laughs> neither have I. I. I suppose they still have it. But anyway, that's got to be the last word for quarter number one. We're going to pick up this conversation as soon as we come back for quarter number two. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It is quarter number two. He's T Frank. I'm Jim. We're talking about an article that uh, T Frank put out last week on BlueWhiteIllustrated.com where you talk about, Frank, the defense and the, uh, the specialty situations when you get third and long. Essentially, it comes down to a topic that you've taught us about several times, which is that 11th guy and where he mm -hmm. comes from. When we wrapped up quarter number one, we were talking about the dominoes falling. You move Abdul Carter from linebacker to defensive end. That opens a linebacker spot. You have Curtis Jacobs moving on. That opens up two linebacker spots, and it gives you more options now. Let's start with the base 4-3 formation. When we see that, who are the personnel we're going to see out of that 4-3, and then we can move from there. So I, I do want to correct just one thing because I want to be I want to I want to make sure we understand we're speaking the same language here. Um, I don't think that this is just about third and long or third down defense. This is about this defense is going to be driven more by sub packages. So it's not just going to be uh, specific situations because that does in, in, in a lot of situations that does limit the, the number of times you're going to see some of these defenses. Uh, this is going to be so much more, I think, situation driven personnel uh, opposing you driven that you're going to see a lot of these uh, defenses more often. And I don't know that base defense. That's just what we call it. I don't know. That's going to be the basis of this defense. But the 4-3 the defense is actually the one that has the least number of answers. 
where we're talking about these linebackers. You just lost two linebackers, one to graduation to the NFL and one to defense events. So Kobe King, that's where I'm going to end it. I know Kobe King is the starting middle linebacker throughout spring. We're going to find out what the combination that makes the most sense for Penn state in these three down linebacker spots is with Tony Rojas, Dom DeLuca, Keon Wiley and KV on keys. Those are the four players that we've kind of, identified as the as the competition for the snaps in this particular package um the conversation around tony rojas is interesting because in february we learned through some conversation with players at, at winter media day that tony rojas was going to be playing uh the field linebacker the sam linebacker position and and that didn't make any sense that didn't make any sense with everything that we have seen and heard because dom deluca as much as I think certain fans don't ever want him on the football field, he produces when he's out there, and the, the, the team loves him. The team loves him because he does the right thing. He's always in position. He's a smart football player. He is a good football player. Is he the guy that you want out there is all the time? No, I don't think so. But he, he, is, he is a valuable member of the defense that I think if you consider him as part of this base defense, he's a starter. So how... I would look at it right now. Tony Rojas can play either of those positions. He might be the Curtis Jacobs that floats between both outside linebacker positions. Um, but then at that will linebacker position, when he's not there, it's a competition between KV on keys and Keon Wiley. So where Wiley plays, I think is also interesting. He's 220 pounds. He makes more sense as a field linebacker than he does as a box linebacker. But we've seen him play both and play both pretty well last year in Manny Diaz's defense in mop-up situations. So there's a lot of instinct there, a former defensive end that knows how to blitz and time his pass rush, and also somebody who uh, I think has good football instincts. Know when He knows when to trigger in coverage and, and uh, in the run game. So he's going to be a factor, but where he factors in, again, this is the part that I think from a – what we're going to learn during spring, this outside linebacker competition, we have some rough ideas in pencil where things are going to be, but I don't know, I think, with any firm certainty what it's going to look like uh, at the end of spring and the start of fall camp when things get really going for fall prep. Well, then, as you pointed out, depend personnel on uh, the opposing team, who you're playing, what style – you may have that four two five as standard base defense. Again, yeah. just using that terminology. And based on what James Franklin told us in his press conference, we might have a feel for what that would look like. This is really, this was the whole reason to write the article was he gave us more depth chart information than he normally does. Now at the spring, start of spring football, he does kind of set the table for everybody and, and will give some, more especially like on the offensive line he at the beginning of spring practice i think in the past he has kind of read the whole depth chart for us whether or not that is accurate after the first week is immaterial he at least gives us a starting point so he did the same thing with the safeties uh he mentioned zaki wheatley and how he's uh, come on more than any other player in uh off season and and had the best off season of his career but he mentioned the line position which you started the show talking about this new linebacker position which is the jim was it the star position is that what manny diaz called it we we had the, i couldn't think of it last week when i was writing this but we talked about it about six months straight on the show what was the name that manny diaz gave this position i, I you know it's funny Pre prepping for the show uh t frank i was trying to think uh, i think star if it wasn't with manny diaz it was with somebody it was the star position yeah, that might have been what they used to call it uh, under Brent Pry. But the point remains, like, this is the first time we've seen this. Uh, Jalen Reed, safety, is going to move to the lion position, the field linebacker, in their uh, three safety packages. And when we know that, we know the overall package then. Because the skill position, the skills of the players determine what positions they're going to play. So KJ Winston was the boundary safety last year. He also has the skills to play that line position as somebody who is big, 6'2", 200 plus pounds. He can run, he can hit. He was basically an extra linebacker at times for Manny Diaz last year, but he's going to play the boundary safety role in this setup now that Jalen Reed has been determined as the lion. And then Jalen Reed, who was playing the field safety last year, that opens up that spot for Zaki Wheatley, who is naturally that field safety uh because there's um 
There's man coverage responsibilities when you are the field safety. Anybody can line up in the slot and play uh, man coverage, but the field safety more often does that. Um, and then, of course, the deep center field sort of things where he's going to read, react, and, and, and intercept passes. So this is kind of a new base, a new slash old base defense. There's a couple of different wrinkles, I think, that we need to understand, though, under Tom Allen versus uh, under the other defense coordinators that have um, come through Penn State under James Franklin in how they're going to use that field position based on what I saw at Indiana on film. And then uh, some other things about this particular defense that I think are important to understand um, as far as this isn't just their third down package. Now, there could be significant overlap, but this is a base defense itself where you can play this on first down, second down, or third down, and that gives you that versatility that we're talking about to play against different matchups and still, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's the other side of the coin where if you said Curtis Jacobs is a good enough coverage player that we don't need to have another safety on the field, this is Jalen Reed's a good enough run defender that we don't need another linebacker on the field. So it's just the priorities shift in this area to emphasize a different skill at that field linebacker position. So if this becomes a bit more of a base defense, T. Frank, what happens when you do get into those third and long? Do you mm -hmm. stay in this? Or do we see another adjustment? Do we... And who would come off the field if we would put in, say, a uh, a, a slot corner? Yeah, so yeah. that I think is the interest. That's probably the biggest mystery right now and the one that I'm most interested in outside the linebacker conversation. Because as much as I said, that one uh, is the least known. It's because there's multiple positions here. We have a good idea of the players that are involved, but how it all works out and who plays where, there's a lot of different combinations. The slot cornerback is a complete unknown at this point. Like, I, I think this is we need to figure out what we have if you're if you're Penn State going into spring practice because you've got athletes that can do it. Like even, even Jalen Kimber, who has never played really in the slot during his career, he's got the athleticism to play in the slot. But the guy that I'm thinking of right away is Zion Tracy. So he's got the athleticism. I think he's got the change of direction skills. He's not Cam Miller, which is important because you want to have your best corner outside all times. Um, even though Cam Miller also could play in the slot. But I would say Tracy would be the guy that makes sense to play on the outside on normal downs in some of the defense we've talked about. And then when you do want to go to maybe a dime defense where you bring on an extra safety and an extra corner, so now you have um, three linebacker or th three defensive linemen and whatever the combination is in the front in, in the front seven, maybe it's the front four, front five, whatever it is, now you've got five defensive backs. And you've if you have to have a slot corner, I would put my money to start on Zion Tracy, but this is an opportunity where we talk about some of those young guys, um, especially the freshmen. Antoine Belgrave Shorter and John Mitchell have the skills um, from an athletic standpoint to be a backup here. The question is, do they have the mental acumen? Can they get integrated into the defense fast enough? Because nickel corners hard. Like you have to understand route concepts. You have to understand leverage two way goes, meaning the the receiver can go either way because on the outside, if he goes to the outside, he's going to the sideline and you have an advantage in the slot. You have to be able to react quickly. You have to be able to understand based on his movements, what he's about to do and how he's trying to attack, not just you, but the defense overall. So that's why you look at veteran guys typically to be that slot corner. Um, and then you want to have guys that have the athleticism to do both of those things. And you need to be able to play a little bit of run defense because we saw last year it's in vogue now to run on third and long because teams are putting 15 defensive backs on the field. So uh, <laughs> you have to do all of those things and be good at all of those things. So I, Zion Tracy was physical in the run defense. Needs to be bigger and stronger, but showed the building block skills. And I guess this is I'm, I'm making the case for why I think he's the guy um, and then we'll figure out if, if that's correct and then where they go from there um, to build the depth chart behind him. And I think what we got to remember, too, with these players having different abilities. You talked about safeties being able to come in the box and tackle. You talk about linebackers being able to cover. So it's uh, not like it's not like baseball. The baseman stands by the third base bag, and that's all they do. You can yeah. do different things. The last note you brought this up, and I had, I hadn't thought about one of the new rules uh, for this season in college football is someone's going to have the green dot on their helmet and can communicate, yep. but you can only have one of those guys on the field at a time. T 
typically the middle linebacker. Does that mean we will always need a middle linebacker on the field, no matter what, T. Frank? It does lead me to the idea that Kobe King is never coming off the field because you, like you said, you can only have one guy with the green dot on the field at the same time. Um, and when you get into third down and you're starting to really distort your packages and who's on the football field, if you take him off and you want to play athletic linebacker, so let's say you've got a package that is Tony Rojas and just Tony Rojas. Well, he either needs a new helmet or he and Kobe King can't be on the same uh, on the field at the same time in base downs. So that doesn't make any sense. So how are you going to distribute those? How do you uh, make those decisions? And do guys have multiple helmets? Because that's an, that's a thing I could see happening is like uh, Tony has a helmet with a green dot and one without. And then you've got to run on and off the field and give him the right helmet based on what down and distance it is. But I don't know. That's going to be something this, that they have to figure out. Uh, it's not a big thing, but it's something long term. It could be a big thing to do the logistics of getting him off the field, to get the new helmet on. T. Frank, that's it for quarter two. Stick around. Quarter three, your questions. And we ask T. Frank. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It is quarter number three. I'm Jim Galante. He is Thomas Frank Carr. Quarter three, time to ask T. Frank. We're going to take your questions for T. Frank. And as always, T. Frank will give us an amazing answer because that's what he does. Uh, if you want to send a question to T. Frank, real easy, just download our app, Keystone Sports. You'll see the Ask T. Frank button. T. Frank, you're smiling there when I say you give us fantastic answers. You always just do. Just don't ask anything. I think the thing we've learned throughout Ask T. Frank is don't ask me any questions about time management or clock rules or any of those things because you're just you're going to get the same answer of i don't know you seem to know and have a bigger opinion about it than i do <laughs> as jim starts shuffling his list of questions here just throw those away <laughs> throw those to the side <laughs> well actually t frank i have learned over time the best questions for you the best questions for andy it actually lasted there were a couple of questions that came in for you and i just said nah T. Frank wants no part of this. <laughs> I asked I the I asked the Andy instead, and uh, and I've been doing that the other way also. So, all right, let's get to it. Let's start with Carl and Charlotte, who says, "I was surprised by Kalen King's slow forty at the combine." With that in mind, can you analyze how that affects his NFL career? Might he end up becoming a safety? And how was he able to have such an impressive 22 season with that lack of athleticism? Um, so I would say that the slow 40 is not indicative of his true speed. This is something we talked about on the Monday show where he was pretty defensive about his 40 time this offseason and talked about his GPS times and NFL teams know how fast he is because he's a game speed guy, not a track, you know, not a timed or track speed guys so there are different ways of measuring athleticism i and, and and generally i think that the conversation has gone too far the wrong way on kalen king because of this offseason so he ran a 452 at penn state's pro day which is much better than a 462 it is still not fast but to answer the last question which is the most important question in this whole thing the whole conversation about kalen king is what happened to his anticipation because that was what was driving his ability as a corner in 2022 opportunity, which he, he still maintained. He didn't get enough targets in, in the first part of the season, um, you know, against some lesser opponents, but also when he did, he wasn't the same guy. So that's the real question I have is not just, you know, not about the, the numbers and not about the testing, because I think it was fairly clear he wasn't Joey Porter Jr. from a traits standpoint, but he was better at football. He was he had better anticipation, ball skills and, um, you know, the, the soft sciences behind cornerback, including confidence and um not that Joey Porter Jr. wasn't confident, but he was just a very confident football player in his abilities and what he was seeing. And that is the biggest mystery to me. So a team is going to bet that he is that guy. I just have a hard time seeing a cornerback, and I know he doesn't have the traits to go in the first round, and I know he doesn't have the traits probably to go in the second round. But if we're talking late fourth, this is a Big Ten starter who had massive production uh, in his career at one point. 
Uh, I think he can go in the fourth or fifth round, which is a, a far cry from where it was before, but it is not this massive to undrafted slide that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. It's just, we, we've gone, the pendulum as always has swung too far the other way. So I think he is somewhere in that range, but uh, there's just, it is a very interesting nuanced conversation about what's on film, as opposed to some of these things that came up, which there's a lot of different ways you can run a bad 40. And also part of it used the word anticipation, which I think is creates quickness. You may not have out and out speed, but you can play quick if you anticipate things. That's what, And I think that's one of those traits that gets underappreciated. And I'll talk about like the word Abdul Carter just seems so quick when he his decision making was good when he was going after the quarterback, when he decided to go. And I think of K.J. Winston the same way. When he just shows up out of nowhere to make a tackle, yes, he's showing quickness, but he's also showing great anticipation that gets him to the spot quicker. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, let's go to Henry in Jersey. who says, James Franklin talked about Nolan Rucci being almost skinny at 300 pounds and that they've already given him up to 315. Mm -hmm. Why didn't that happen at Wisconsin? Was it intentional to keep the weight off of him? Yeah, that's that's the area of speculation that I don't really have a good answer for. I don't know what the decision making process was. I would say that in especially Luke Fickle in in, in uh, the new Wisconsin regime, which always sounds so severe when we use regime <laughs> or dynasty like we need some better words that are not so militaristic and fascist when we talk about football anyway side conversation um nolan root yes they they wanted to have him be athletic but there's no offensive line in the world that wants a sub 300 pound offensive lineman no matter what you want to have a guy who's 315 320 and moves like he's 300 pounds and the whole thing about nolan is he has the ability to do that based on his frame being 6 8 and being so mobile and bendy and athletic and flexible he can add all that weight so then the question becomes what was going on it is an it is a fair and open speculation it's also i mean if he transferred some context clues about maybe that's a reason he wanted to transfer was he was not happy about the way that he was being developed or the resources or any of the things at Wisconsin and Penn state. It has a very uh, prodigious um, weight training player development, nutrition program um, that gets the most out of players. So the fact that he's already gotten to three fifteen when he can be as big as you want him to be and be athletic is a, is a huge positive sign. Um, that it is he is capable of putting on the weight because that's the same thing we talk about with Garrett Sexton and Egan Boyer of these guys that are six seven six eight six six and they got these big frames can they add, can they truly add the weight and not lose anything and it that is always a, a bit, little bit of a gamble but clearly Rucci later in his career is able to do that um, and then it becomes about the development side with Phil Troutwine. But yeah, th there's no, th I don't have a good answer for you in terms of why it didn't happen, but it is a great sign that it has happened so quickly from Nolan's perspective of putting in the work in the weight room to make that happen. And then from Penn State's ability to actually make it happen with the resources and the knowledge and the science behind it. A couple things, Frank, you talked about the regime change. When the coach leaves, does that mean he was toppled? Like the dictator it's, that toppled, kind right? It feels like it sometimes, right? Like there's a there's a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and the other part to this is I, I, I'm really glad you brought up Fickle because we just typically think of Wisconsin offensive linemen as these big guys. We think of the Wisconsin offense as the three yards and clouded dust. We got to start thinking about Wisconsin differently than, than we had uh, uh, traditionally. So it's a different Wisconsin. Uh, let's uh, let's see. Let's go to Ed in Mechanicsburg, who says, "Can you give your best pass on a two deep for the offensive line?" <laughs> no, not at this point. Um, and James Franklin mentioned Drew Shelton is not going to be available for spring football. He also said that Garrett Sexton wouldn't be available for spring football. So you can take two tackles and you can uh, you know remove them from the list. So. 
uh, I, I'll I'll give you the guys that I think are at the positions that are important. And I, you know, there's there's some stuff like go to bluewhiteillustrated.com. You my my coworkers have a lot of this stuff. They've already gone into and, and dug into this and have some good reporting. But uh Rucci and Anthony Donko are the guys at that right tackle position that I think are important. Um, Donko has the upper hand as the incumbent, I guess you could say the guy that's been in the program a year longer um, and has played meaningful snaps. Weirdly, they've played almost the same number of college snaps uh, in, in, in three years versus one year. Uh, and then on the left side, that's the area without Drew Shelton this spring and, and kind of learning that he had an injury last year that he played through, which we didn't know, explains the step back that we saw from him as a football player where he came in and he's playing left tackle, he's playing right tackle. He's not playing well. And then he plays really bad in the bowl game. And I honestly, that made me feel better about what I had seen and, and knowing that he was injured and performing that way, as opposed to he took a literal step back in his development. So JB Nelson, Javen Williams, those are the guys on the left side at that tackle position that I think are the, uh, players will see more this spring, but it does kind of leave a very incomplete picture at tackle when you don't have your number one returner on the left side. We'll have to see how all of that shakes out. But those are the those are the three players with JB Nelson as a swing guy who really probably is the true fourth tackle anyway that we're going to see uh, in the next couple of months. Also. I forgot one of my points from the uh, earlier question, but it was still talking an offensive lineman when you were talking about Nolan Rucci uh, at 6'8". The fact is they feel like confident they could put weight on him. So these younger guys like Egan Boyer, these tall guys, always reminds me of the saying, you know what, uh, T. Frank, you could make a guy who weighs 280 into 320. You can't make a six foot two guy six foot six. Yep. No way yep. you could do that. So, um, and having seen a couple of the the young players tackles who are that six seven six eight, boy, they really you buying the expression from uh, James Franklin. They do look skinny. They yeah. do look like they could carry a lot more weight. And it looked they they were looking for that kind of body shape athleticism and saying they're confident that they could put the weight on them. Uh, let's go to Sam in York, uh, T. Frank, who would say, who says, how would you rate a starting trio of Julian Fleming, Lambert Smith, and Trey Wallace at wide receiver, and do they complement each other? So the answer there is yes, they do complement each other. I think they have individual skills, some overlapping skills, and then they have a, a, a good floor how I would rate them is incomplete because I have no clue. Trey Wallace has potential. Like he could be an explosive deep threat. He could be a chain mover. He's got the versatility to be maybe even the number one guy, but he's never on the football field. We have yet to see anything from him. Keandre Lambert Smith, I think proved the one thing we learned last year is he can't carry a team from volume perspective. He is a good explosive play threat. He can get open. He can make those big plays, but I think that's better. That the better role for him is four targets for 95 yards and a touchdown, as opposed to eight targets for 85 yards. And that's where Julian Fleming comes in. He's a guy that can play well against zone. He's got more speed. I think than people are giving him credit for, even if he isn't a four, three athlete, he is fast enough in, in a long distance sense, like he has good straight line speed. He's tall. He can get deep, but he's not an, an elite separator. Um, he's got to use other skills to get open in the intermediate. So I'd say they're a good trio, but it's not a trio that's going to blow you away unless somebody takes a significant step forward. Very good. T Frank. That is it. T Frank stick around. We got one more quarter to go. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I'm Jim. He's T. Frank. We're talking about Penn State football. Just got done quarter number three with your questions and ask T. Frank. And then T. Frank, in uh, quarter number one and two, we were talking about an article that you wrote about the defense. Essentially, it's that 11th player, that variable. What's he going to be? And that, that could be almost any position. It could be a cornerback. It could be a linebacker. It could be a safety. Heck, you could probably, on short yardage down, you could put in that fifth down lineman. 
Now, what I want to do for this last quarter, though, is kind of carry that conversation over to the offense side of the ball. When you have, you know, a, these days in college football, if there is a base for men, it's probably three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back, and, and that that's the standard formation. But we learned from Penn State over the last couple years, having two tight ends sometimes could it ends up being the base for a mission. So I guess the question is, if you're Penn State, what is that base formation? And I know you've always been an advocate for the three wide receivers, but it sounded it's sounded like over the last couple of years, essentially the tight ends and wide receivers were in the same competition to get on the field. Yeah, I mean, James Franklin outright said that, that it's not just about the receivers in the receiver room competing for the third receiver spot, but it's not given that you're on the field because they have other talents. And I'm throwing this upcoming season two running backs as well. This is something we've seen from uh, Andy Kotelnicki. It's never going to be the basis of your offense. Dear Lord, save me if it is. You know, that there's something very wrong about Penn State's offense if, if Katron Allen and Nick Singleton are on the field at the same time all the time. That's going to be a problem. Um, but yeah, I think 11 personnel, meaning one running back, one tight end, three receivers is the most explosive on average. It is the most explosive personnel lineup in college football because on average receivers gain more yards on passing plays than tight ends or running back run gain on rushing plays. So when you have more opportunities to throw for more yards, you have more opportunities for those vaunted explosive plays. An explosive passing play, the reason it has a higher threshold is because on average, a receiver gains nine yards a catch in college football. So, like, why wouldn't you want to throw the ball more? Why wouldn't you want to go with three receivers more? Why wouldn't you want to be more explosive, especially because schematically what you do when you have three receivers um, is you are spreading the field out. You are creating threat advantages outside of the tackle box because let's talk in very basic terms about offensive football we talked about the defense and the different uh combinations you can have you can have any combination of players on the football field on defense you can have zero defensive linemen but on offense you have to have five players on the line of scrimmage that are ineligible that are just blockers you have to have i guess you don't have to have but you have to have a quarterback so six players on offense are in locked positions so that gives you less options and you also have less ability to spread the field. So you need to use as much of your resources as possible to create threats to all parts of the field, not just between the tackle box where we want to cram bodies and be masculine football. Like there are advantages to being able to threaten the middle of the field through the line of scrimmage. I, I, I always, it always comes out as me um, crapping on the run game. And that's not the case. But I, I, it is pushing back against the notion that you need to play with two tight ends and a running back and a fullback and neck rolls and all of those things because it's guaranteed that you'll get four yards, which is not true. You can also get negative yards. So anyway, three receivers, probably the best option if you can get three receivers that are true threats on the football field. Which all that landed. Back. <laughs> Which leads back to our, you know, question in uh, the Ask T. Frank segment about the three. Uh, the assumption by our questioner was Julian Fleming, uh, Keandre Lambert Smith, and Trey Wallace as the three wide receivers, and mm -hmm. are they good enough to keep the second tight end off the field? Are they, T. Frank? I don't, I don't know. I, I, Come on, I, team friend. <laughs> all the answers. <laughs> um, so, you know, in a, in Andy Kolonicki's offense last year, where he didn't really have a quarterback, they still majored in 11 personnel. Last year, where the tight ends, other than Keandre Lambert Smith, who was the offense, like Mike Yersich designed the offense around Keandre Lambert Smith. From a volume target perspective, from a first read perspective, all those things, he was, he was the primary receiver. Um, but last year they played a lot of 12 personnel and they still played more 11 than 12. So that should tell you exactly where this conversation is. Um, they're going to play both packages, but it's, you know, what is your base down? What do you go to? Where are your, we got to have it, uh, personnel lineups. So I, I, I don't know. And I want, I want to say, no, I want to say they are not given what they have at tight end. 
you know, high four star players, elite talent. Tyler Warren coming back as this guy that should be able to be a dominant run blocker. He's got to get better at that. And also a incredibly dangerous threat as a receiver. He can do all of those things. So he's going to be a feature in the offense. Andy Kolonicki has proven he does more to get tight ends open and isolated through scheme and formation and all those shifts and things that he can he can get that tight end against a player that is a disadvantage. But the slot receiver also is an explosive part of this offense. So you could say that Keandre Lambert-Smith, now that you have Julian Fleming, uh, in more of a sure thing, unlocks Keandre Lambert-Smith a little bit better. But Keandre Lambert-Smith has to play with more consistency. He has to be a more dependable player on the football field for that to be the case. So uh, that's a, I, I think as much as the other conversations we're having about who's going to step up and push these guys in the receiver room, that's, that's the basis of what we're talking about is there's a baseline of what these guys can be, but the inconsistency of what they have been makes me nervous to say, yeah, this, this works. The balance is better this year with Fleming on the football field. And if Trey Wallace gets hurt, you still have other guys. And I, I hate to put that on him, but it is something that we have to talk about because it was a significant thing the last couple of years. Um, you have a Malik McLean. You have other guys. Anthony Ivy, I think, is somebody who could play the X, which is where Trey Wallace plays, who's a young guy who's now in his third year. They have more options on the outside. So how they balance the threats on the football field is a little bit more optimistic this year than it was last year. But we're still talking about leadership. We're still talking about pushing guys. We're still talking about all those things. And I think, you know, we look at the we look at the receiver position, and that's the number one conversation this offseason has been what are they going to be? And and that is not answered yet. T Frank, we talked about all the special down and distance formations on defense in the first couple segments. Let's talk a little bit about that on the offensive side. You yeah. have two yeah. very good running backs. You have, uh, we believe, multiple tight ends who could be on the field. Actually, you have two quarterbacks that you could put out on the field right. who are very good. So you've you've done some uh, somewhat of a dive into how Andy Kotelnicki does these things from his last couple stops. How should we expect him to use the two running backs, the two quarterbacks, the multiple tight ends, and when? Um, so I think this is, the more I've watched, the more I think this is closer to Joe Moorhead, so creatively. And that's a good thing. like that. So he's going to use, the mandate from James Franklin, apparently, was get Bo Perbula involved in the offense, and Mike Yersich didn't you know, just virtually didn't use the backup quarterback and his athleticism um, through necessity. I think a lot at Kansas, but also like just using all of the pieces and resources at your disposal. Andy Cole, Nicky did some very creative things with two quarterbacks, two running backs, three receivers, two tight ends, three tight ends, a bunch of different stuff. So we've seen examples of where it works from him at Kansas. So he will use two quarterbacks this year. He will use Bo Prabula in specific packages. And I've kind of earmarked the two running back package for Bo Prabula because at least based on uh, Kansas, there was a lot of option football with those two running backs. And that's really how you leverage the threat of those running backs to the best advantage. There's some passing game concepts that I've covered over at BlueWayIllustrated.com and T. Frank's film room, lining guys up in the slot, motioning them, putting them in offensive oddity formations, like lined up next to the tackle, but not at tight end, like a really tight split to the offensive line gives you some opportunities, but a lot of it is based around option football. And if the first practice that we got was any indication of what they plan to do with the quarterback, option is on the table. All of it that we saw at Kansas is on the table. But where are you using your players to the best of their abilities? So for that 21 personnel, two running backs, one tight end, I think you're going to see a good bit of Bo Prabula in those areas. But like I said before, that doesn't fix the passing game. Because the minute you switch those guys off the field, the quarterback should also be able to throw the football or else it just limits and, and brings everything into the box. You are creating an opportunity for the defense to know where the ball is going to be because your main threats, your running backs and your tight end and everything is right in the middle of the field. So you need to be able to find a way to balance the threats. And that means the quarterback has to be able to throw the ball at all times. And the quarterback has to be able to run the ball at all times, meaning Drew has to run and Bo has to throw. 
So I think we'll see more of that. I think we'll see more diversity, less paint by numbers sort of situations with football players. And, and that's something they've got to do to create these advantages to win against teams that might have an edge in talent. That's the whole point of offenses like this create advantages that are beyond physical ability to give you that advantage when you're going up against teams with superior talent. And Penn state has had that glass ceiling for 10 years now. So they need to find a way to break through it. And this is one of this is the next attempt with this particular offense that creates all those advantages through non uh, athleticism, you know, scheme and formation and things like that. Help me out when you said uh, about Bo Prabula, that two running back situation. Are you talking about having two running backs in when Bo is the quarterback, or are you talking about Bo lining up as one of those two running backs? Yes. Yeah, I was talking about specifically Catron Allen and, and Nick Singleton, but yeah, that's it. You get you just brought up a perfect augmentation of what we saw in order to create an advantage for the offense. So having two quarterbacks in the backfield, maybe Bo Prabula is the one that lines up in the center, and Drew Aller is the one that lines up at running back. Who knows? Like that's the point of Andy Cole Nicky's. He'll do anything. So then you you have an option play with your passing quarterback that is now just a bootleg. It's the same play, but it's just a bootleg when you were looking from a run first offensive formation and suddenly you have the defense thinking run and now you're going pass. That's just one example of a, a million different things that Andy Kotelnicki could do. But specifically what I was talking about was two running backs. You have an option in the flat with a speed option, um, you know, triple option style. You have your dive player and your quarterback is a running option. So those are the three threats in the backfield that make the most sense to use Katron Allen, Nick Singleton and an athletic quarterback. But again, you can't just have it be run because you can just add more players to the box. You have to be able to throw the ball in those situations as well. All right. Thank. That'll be the last word. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Make sure you join us next time on the Keystone kickoff show.